Welcome, everyone. Welcome to another uh, Men's Support Group uh, presentation by uh, Cultivating Healing and Justice Initiative uh, Support Services. You stand up for uh, prostate cancer. Um, I am the founder, Louis Abramson, and a Latino and prostate cancer survivor, husband uh, of two, and uh, also a very passionate man in, uh, on advocacy and uh, uh, community and health education. And uh, we do this uh, virtual support group uh, for you, those of, that are, uh, of you that are new. And uh, we uh, present uh, a uh, presenter that educates us and uh, fills us with knowledge uh, all the time. Uh, today, uh, we are very blessed to have um, Dr. Michael Wald, um, also known as the Blood Detective. Um, uh, and uh, he's also the creator of a medical software called uh, Blood Logic, and um, also the uh, host um, of a radio show by the uh, by the name uh, PRN uh, on FM, um, uh, uh, titled "Axe the Blood Detective." Um, an incredible. Uh, trajectory uh, career, an impressive, impressive uh, resume, um, board certified uh, 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 medical uh, uh, nutritionist, sports uh, nutritionist, uh, uh, acupuncture, you name it. Um, also has the also has done dozens of uh, book uh, 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 publications. Uh, uh, he has published and also has appeared in many, many uh, um, uh, tele television channels. Uh, so uh, I am very, very um, happy uh, that uh, he is coming to our group today to share his knowledge. Um, I want to say first, um, please keep your uh, mics on uh, muted. Allow the speaker to be able to uh, do his presentation. And as soon as... Um, uh, we're done with that. We will move into uh, Q&A uh, where you can ask as many uh, questions as you will like to our uh, special speaker. So with uh, uh, no further ado, I will present to you Dr. Michael Walt. Hi, everyone. I appreciate you being here. So I guess the next thing that's going to happen is the uh, PowerPoint presentation should show up. And here we go. And then uh, as we said, uh, at the end of this presentation, I'll be taking questions. So feel free to jot down those questions uh, during the conversation. So as you can see from the title of the PowerPoint, I'm gonna read it to you, uh, Prostate Cancer Prevention, Treatment and Natural Approaches. So the information that I'm gonna be giving you here today, by the way, is not only applicable to prostate cancer, but um, many, many other cancers, dozens of other cancers. So I'll try to make that clear as we move along. So whether prostate cancer is your interest or any other cancer, there are certain underlying ways in which cancer affects a person that most all cancers have in common. Uh, and because of that, varying nutritional uh, products, nutritional compounds, natural compounds could apply to many different forms of cancer. Let's go to the next slide, please. So just a quick uh, disclaimer reading here, obviously this information is for your educational purposes. It's not meant to substitute as medical or health advice and any use or misuse of this information is, is on you. So it can get a little complicated. So I would suggest that you meet with a qualified uh, healthcare professional, uh, preferably one that can read laboratory so they can figure out your exact nutritional needs. And let's move to the next slide, please. Um, you can read all about me later on. The only thing that this is missing is acupuncture, but uh, I think what's important to know for the purpose of this talk is that I have many um, diplomas and educational credentials in the area of nutrition, including two board certifications. I'm also a dietitian, a certified nutrition specialist, and these are different kinds of nutritionists that do different things. So I felt that I needed all of this to really get a handle on cancer. Next slide, please. And let's go to the next one, since we know we're talking about cancer nutrition. So. This is uh, sort of important here. This was a, uh, I want to just mention that what I've done with these slides is I've titled them 
almost exactly, if not the exact titles of certain medical journal articles that um, describe what each slide is about underneath. So there was a population-based survey of complementary and alternative medicine uh, use in men, and that was the title of the article, and it came up with these statistics. The reason why I'm giving, you know, as we go through these slides, I'm gonna use, you know, some big words in here. The reason is there may be physicians that eventually watch this that know nothing about nutrition, particularly oncologists, because they don't get any nutrition uh, other than maybe a few hours, you know, in their uh, in medical school. So we want to educate everyone. And I feel I don't want to water this information down because it's, it's too important. So I'll try to define as many terms as possible. But what I wanted to emphasize to you with this slide is that when we're talking about what they call CAM therapy, CAM, that just means complementary alternative medical therapies, holistic therapies, natural therapies, alternative therapies, they're all sort of used the same. Although there are differences, we don't have time to really distinguish them. But these natural therapies, as this says here, is that the most common reason people use them is because number one, the second bullet here, they, they want to boost their immune systems. Um, another uh, bullet here says that the majority of men, for example, because this was the study that surveyed men in this particular study, um, only 58% of them even told their doctors they were using any natural therapies. And I know from my experience, most of my patients do not uh, choose to tell their doctors they're afraid they're going to be ridiculed or made fun of. So I'm not going to tell you not to tell your doctors, but you might expect that, particularly if the doctor's not trained. And the doctor is a person, and sometimes there are biases and there are reactions and emotions. But you know, we're going to just talk about science here. So you need to remember that this is going to be in the public's eye. And uh, I have to be careful that the information I give you is accurate, so you can bet that it is. And then um, the, the second to the last bullet on this slide says that those that use complementary alternative therapies mostly learned about what they're using from their friends, 39% uh, of them, and 19% use the internet. And between cancer groups on Facebook, for example, I've seen some of them, so I'm generalizing here for a minute, but those, some that I've seen, the amount of misinformation, it, it borderline, uh, I mean, it's really, some of it's just dangerous, and some of it's just absolutely wrong. Um, and there's... Uh, very little accurate information there. So I don't really suggest um, using internet as your only source of information. And um, let's go to the next slide. So when we talk about prostate cancer, we need to understand a couple of basic things. One is that the current approaches to the management of prostate cancer, which include surgery, radiation therapy, hormonal manipulation, or some combinations of these are generally what is available. And uh, we know that uh, prostate cancer still remains the most common malignancy of men and the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. So it's still a huge problem. And I believe that that gap can be closed if we paid careful attention to nutrition. This course, even though it's a short one, is meant to elevate you. You will definitely know some things when you leave here that might've taken you years to figure out or to clarify. And certainly, and most of your doctors, with all due respect to them, most will not know this. And um, basically, the last statement I think said a lot, with an increase in understanding of the etiology of natural history of prostate cancer, we see more and more the influence and the opportunity for nutrition. So I'll explain more of what I mean by that in a few moments. Let's go to the next one, please. Okay, so I've got a couple of slides here of some very important concepts. Some of these are true statements, some of these are not true. And these come from my population of patients. And please understand that I've been practicing uh, natural health care uh, for about 32 years. So I've heard quite a lot, and this is what I've heard. Number one, nutrition plays a role in cancer treatment and prevention, true or false. It should, it absolutely should. Either a person person's uh, susceptibility to cancer was caused by nutritional problems, or at the very least, their cancer results in nutritional problems. So in either scenario, nutrition plays a major role. And I'll be making some pretty outrageous statements as I go through this, but every single one of them were from studies. And the studies were usually based upon the title of the slide. So if you were to search that title of that slide, scholarly articles will pop up when you do a Google search, which will lead you to the National Library of Medicine, which is one of the two major places where we get these kinds of studies from. The second bullet is diet and nutritional supplements may be an essential part of a comprehensive nutrient and prostate uh, plan in either prostate cancer or any cancer. Yes, yes, yes. Nutrition should be 
a major part of it. If we take a healthy person and we alter their diet adversely, let's say we reduce their proteins uh, to, to a level that's unhealthy, they're gonna have a poor immune response. A poor immune response, almost everyone knows, can make one susceptible to cancer and infections. In fact, I'll be saying, well, right down here that the second book, the number one cause of death in most cancer is actually not the cancer. It's secondary malnutrition and infections. And the infections are usually from malnutrition. So nutrition is a major, major player. Oncologists typically are not trained in nutrition, but that doesn't mean that your oncologist is not. You would need to ask them. And then ask what their, their, their uh, nutrition education is, because if it was a weekend seminar, you might wanna find another oncologist if nutrition is important to you. And um, the fourth bullet here, that dietitians, generally speaking, are not adequately trained by themselves to deal with cancer uh, nutrition patients unless they have done extra study. But dietitians do not read lab work, they do not do exams, so most are limited. Um, I, I have a dietitian's degree as well, and I can tell you that from just experience, it's just not enough. But there are exceptions. And then the last bullet here is laboratory uh, work is uh, it's critical, actually, um, in any type of cancer, whether it's prevention, treatment, or, or prevention of secondary cancers from radiation and chemotherapy. The laboratory work, if read nutritionally, just gives a whole other layer of understanding of what that person needs to keep them resilient. Next slide, please. So we already discussed the role of dietitians. It's limited. Uh, and then there are clinical nutritionists. Um, clinical nutritionists are uh, licensed uh, in most states, like in New York, there's certified nutrition specialist. That's a clinical nutritionist. And they are among the top three licensed professionals. Um, they're, uh, uh, in my experience, a little bit more adept at treating cancer, uh, or at least lending their, their knowledge to treating cancer because they learn about nutritional supplements. Dietitians in their education, for the most part, are told supplements are not needed other than a multivitamin or some pregnancy thing. But that's about it. Um, we discussed nutritional interpretation of lab. What that means is this. When I look at a person's laboratory work, and when you have seen your laboratory work in the past, you know, you have results. Those results are compared to ranges. You know, your cholesterol range might be from 100 to 200. Your vitamin D is 30 to 100. But let's look at vitamin D, for example. Vitamin D the optimal value of vitamin D, which means the best number that most people should be at, which reduces their overall risk of diseases better than any other number, is a 70. So even though 31 is normal and 50 is normal, they're not as good or not as optimal as a 70. So when I nutritionally interpret labs, I'm interpreting them medically, but also looking at how people compare to optimal ranges in labs. That means those ranges are based on either studies of healthy people or, or studies of people who they have correlated the, the best place to be on those labs with the least problemsome uh, health histories, okay? So patients will say to me, Dr. Wald, how is it I'm diagnosed with cancer or whatever else their complaints is, it might be autoimmune disease or something else, how is that true in my labs? My doctor's saying my labs are normal. Well, your labs are not complete. Number one, they can't be. Number two, even if they were complete somehow, they may have been misinterpreted. Um, you're, you might have abnormalities on your labs, but your doctor doesn't mention them to you because they don't add up to something big in their minds. In my mind, they might, you see. So different practitioners interpret things differently. Just like one person can look at a piece of art one way, who's, a, let's say, an art enthusiast. They say, wow, it's, that's amazing. And another person says, that's terrible. Get that out of here. So but I, I have a, a medical education and I have a nutritional education. So that, that kind of opens up things for me a little differently. And then someone will say to me, well, Dr. Wald, you know, I've, I've eaten well throughout my life. How did I get cancer? I did everything right. I've been a vegan, for example. Some people will tell me that. First of all, even if you've eaten what appears to be a healthy diet, let's say a diet that is, it is uh, absent of, of sugar, refined and processed foods, no fried foods, no trans uh, fatty acids, um, you're eating lower down on the food chain, meaning more fruits and vegetables and less higher up on the food chain, less animal products. Those are known to be better for uh, reducing overall disease risk and improving what's known as the 
non-disability stage of life. So it's one thing living longer, but don't you want to live longer during the non-disability stage, the more active stage? And the way to do that is not to think that you're, you know, like be confused about your diet because your diet, um, you might have done a vegetarian diet, let's say, but you might have done the protein wrong, or you may have not gotten enough iron or enough B12 or enough folic acid. So you might think you have a healthy, proper diet, but you may not have. Now, on the other hand, sometimes I look at someone's diet and it's perfect, except they've only been doing it for five years, but most of their lives, they weren't watching it. Or we have to also consider that dietary problems are not the only cause of prostate cancer, but with prostate cancer specifically, they know that there are many, many dietary influences on uh, prostate cancer and what they called epigenetic influences, meaning that when the baby is born, from that moment on, the environment impacts how certain genes express. So that's called genetic expression. So if someone has, let's say, uh, a bunch of genes that are a little weak in the immune area, but no specific genetic disease, just some weak, weaker genes, um, pollution, poor nutrition can have those genes together act like problematic genes and could could cause cancer in a person. So when, you, when you've heard that prostate cancer doesn't have a specific genetic cause, that might be true now, that might actually be true forever, but every condition in human beings is affected by epigenetic influences, meaning the genetics you have when you're born, they can be adjusted and they are adjusted through diet. Okay, and I give you some more information here about genetics, I won't read that. Um, this third to last statement, there's no evidence to justify nutrition. I've heard this by some patients saying, Dr. Wald, I don't understand it. My doctor is this, that, and the other thing. He or she says there's no evidence for nutrition. What do you say about that? And I say, well, I, I don't know why they would say that other than maybe a lack of training. But if you go to the National Library of Medicine website, which is pubmed.com, or the Cochrane database, those are the two most common search engines that, that researchers and doctors use to check for these things. So if you go there, it would take you, I don't know, 10 seconds to look up a search. And if you check, let's say prostate cancer and um, green tea, you wouldn't even live long enough to read all the studies. You can read them for 50 years. That's how much study there is. Um, so I, I don't know what to tell you beyond that without being rude. <laughs> and then does medicine have all the answers? Of course it doesn't. Does nutrition have all the answers? Of course not. We want to get the information from where it comes so we have a balanced education and balanced options. And if we really understand nutrition a little bit better, we're going to be able to cut through a lot of the false stuff floating around out there because there is a lot of that. Next slide, please. More misconceptions. So eating a balanced diet is all I need to prevent or treat or manage prostate cancer. And even if you have prostate cancer and you've successfully treated it, you know that the reasons for you getting the prostate cancer probably have not been looked at at all. At least that's true in my experience. You know, when I say to a patient, so did anyone look into why you might have gotten prostate cancer? The, the answer is they say, I don't know. Uh, all I know they say is my, my hormones were high, so they blocked it. Well, why were they high? I, it could be from pollution. It could be from um, lack of certain nutrients which affect hormones. So, uh, diet, though, is important. It may not be everything. May there, there may be toxins. You know, there's cadmium, yeah, there's mercury, and there's, uh, and there's arsenic. Um, cadmium, in particular, can uh, raise uh, estrogen and testosterone levels. So these are not things that oncologists generally look into. And then I mentioned PubMed.com. Uh, will there be a magic bullet for prostate cancer or any cancer? I doubt that will ever happen. Um, and if it does happen, I'll be the first one to apologize, but there won't be a magic bullet for nutrition either. Some patients would say, Dr. Wald, I heard that this supplement, and they'll hold up a supplement, they'll say, this is the, I heard this is the best for immunity. I'll say, well, I don't know what part of the immune system is affected, so I don't know if that's true. And they'll say, what do you mean? I'll say, well, you know, vitamin C affects certain aspects of your immune system, and mushrooms of a D, what's called a defraction, affect your immune system very differently, and astragalus and golden seal and these other things, they work differently. So a combination of plant elements, plant nutrients called phytonutrients, 
uh, are usually needed to get the kinds of effects you need. If you're going to take just green tea and think that's going to do it for your lycopene, it's not going to. Okay? And then the statement, uh, you are what you eat. You are not what you eat. You are what you absorb from what you eat. So 60% of people over age 50 malabsorb. They do not absorb fully what they're eating. Not only that, if cancer is going on in a person's body, whether they know it or not, there's often a hyper metabolism, a hyper use of nutrition, and a person ends up deficient, like with zinc. That's a very common deficiency in prostate cancer and also prostate enlargement. And um, not to mention um, uh, Down syndrome and autism, which will be the topics of the next presentation that I believe we're giving, I think it's next week. Um, <clears throat> so, um, these conditions increase your nutritional needs as well. Do nutrients work immediately and right away? Sometimes, but usually they don't because nutrition is meant to repair things. So if you take something that fix, seemingly fixes you right away, it's almost certainly a medication and temporary. There's nothing wrong with that. You just, I think you just need to know what, what you should expect. And then this, this concept of the last bullet here of alkalinity. You know, I'm sure many of you have heard this concept that we should be alkaline. Um, that's a meaningless concept. Um, for those of you, I'm gonna give you a statement why that is and you'll, you'll understand it in the next 120 seconds. That's all it'll take. But on my website, under my blog section, or you can search the homepage at uh, drmichaelwald.com, search for PH Lies, and you get another hour show teaching you everything that you ever need to know, more than what your doctors probably know about PH. So here it is. Why is this statement that alkaline pH, uh, you should be alkaline is wrong? Well, I'm not saying there isn't, we need to be acid and alkaline where we need to be acid and alkaline, but we don't need to be alkaline as a whole thing. First of all, that's not even possible. Our mouths need to be alkaline because the amylase enzyme requires alkaline uh, environment. Our stomach needs to be acid, right? We all know this, we don't have stomach acid, we're not absorbing much of anything. Our urine should be on the acid side. So when people get urinary tract infections, they take acidophilus to acidify the urine because it was too alkaline giving infection. So alkaline isn't always good, you see. And then the blood pH is about 7.45. So that's, you know, the pH scale is zero to 14. Seven is neutral, water's neutral. 7.45 is just to the left of neutral. That's not alkaline and that's not acid. If we made our blood alkaline, um, and, and there's, there's some reasons in some ways at some times when you want to move the blood pH on the alkaline end, when you're in a hospital situation and maybe you're suffering from metabolic acidosis, you know, then you need to have sodium bicarbonate in an IV to make you more alkaline. But if you continue to be alkaline, that would be detrimental and you couldn't even live properly. So I hope that makes some sense. Next slide, please. So this was a study that used a product, a compound called quercetin, and I'm sure many of you have heard of that. And the title of this article is Quercetin Inhibits Prostate Cancer by Attenuating Cell Survival and Inhibiting Apoptotic Pathways. That's a mouthful. <laughs> All you need to know from that is quercetin is generally good in the prevention and treatment and also recurrence possibilities of prostate cancer because it helps, to, uh, helps the body um, balance out um, cell death. So apoptosis is a good thing. That's programmed cell death. And sometimes in cancer, there's certain chemicals that are preventing that. Quercetin helps to promote cell death, okay? It also works in many other ways. So um, in other words, uh, quercetin is also an, a very important antioxidant. And oxidation tends to drive most cancer events, okay? And at the very, very, very least, the last bullet here says that um, quercetin, along with other what they call phytonutrients, that just means uh, compounds that are from plants in fruits and vegetables, they can reduce the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation dramatically. Next slide, please. Now, I should mention at this point, too, that depending on what medications are on your particular situation, certain nutrients may be better or worse for you. Uh, sometimes there are positive nutrient drug interactions that you want to take advantage of. Uh, like for example, using resveratrol 
which is that stuff you've heard, that phytonutrient that's in uh, red wine and in grapes, you know, for example, but it's in most fruits and vegetables, that helps reduce the side effects of radiation. So why wouldn't you do that? Now, there may be some reason why your oncologist doesn't want you to, to do these things. So that's something you'd have to discuss with them. But let's look here um, at this particular slide. This has to do with melatonin for the prevention and treatment of cancer. So I want you to know that both animal studies and human studies have shown that melatonin has very strong anti-cancer properties. It needs to be taken in the right dose at the right time in the right circumstances. But when it does, one of these bullets says here that melatonin can be utilized as an adjuvant. That means in addition to regular therapies, reinforcing the therapeutic effects and reducing the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. That's what this article entitled, entitled Melatonin for the Prevention and Treatment of Cancer said. So um, the last bullet here says melatonin could be an excellent candidate for the prevention and the treatment of several cancers, including breast cancer, prostate, gastric cancer, colorectal cancer. So these are statements that are out there in the middle of the slide, this MT1, MT2. Those are just some specific uh, chemicals that melatonin affects. I just won't go into these now because you can get your hands on these slides. The next slide, please. Anti-cancer effects of green tea polyphenols against prostate cancer. So um, polyphenols are just another fancy term for certain types of compounds in plant foods, like tea, but also in most fruits and vegetables, you'll find polyphenols. But specifically, green tea consumption is reported to play an important role in the prevention of cancer and many types of malignancies, which include specifically prostate cancer. The efficacy and safety of green tea polyphenols are very well studied. They have virtually no side effects. Again, both prevention and treatment, not just for prostate cancer, but other hormonal cancers like breast cancer. Breast cancer is basically prostate cancer in a woman or in a man if he happens to have breast cancer. Very similar things. The last uh, bullet here is very important. It says that green tea polyphenols influence tumor growth by reducing tumor growth. They enhance cell death, which is apoptosis, and they help to block the androgen receptors, which are the hormone receptors that feed um, prostate cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and the like. The next slide is also about green tea, which emphasizes some other important things. So let's go to the next slide right now, please. Actually, it's not. The next, I think the one after this is for green tea, but let me go to acetyl L-carnitine. So you might have heard of carnitine. It's, a, it's an amino acid. Acetyl L-carnitine is a particular form of the amino acid that is particularly good because it reduces cancer invasion in the body. And it also helps to reduce blood, uh, blood vessel formation, which tends to drive many cancers. So the conclusion of this study using acetyl L-carnitine is the results highlight the capability of acetyl L-carnitine to downregulate, to inhibit the growth of cancer cells, to reduce the fact that cancer cells stick to things. That's called adhesion. And then the next cancer cell comes by the blood vessel and it sticks to that, that sticks to that, sticks to that, then you have a tumor. So you want to reduce adhesion by making everything kind of friable so it doesn't stick together. So acetyl L-carnitine has been shown to do this. And then I give you all the fancy big words here about how it actually does that. So very, very important. In most patients I've ever seen with cancer of the prostate, and most kids, they've never even heard of this. Let's go to the next slide, please. I should mention now, I don't have a slide on this, but protein balance in general is critical for cancer patients, for prevention, for treatment, and then long after particularly if chemotherapy and radiation have been uh, exposed to the patient, uh, because you can mitigate and reduce a lot of the side effects, including secondary cancers, as I mentioned earlier, from chemotherapy and radiation with the right nutrition. But protein, you need to build lean organ mass. Lean organ mass, as I'll talk about more later, is a very important test. It's called a biomarker test. The more lean mass on a person, the better their survivability and quality of life. It's that good of a predictor. It should be done on every person from, from a young age because it can predict a lot of health problems later on. 
So overall protein balance can be determined based on that test, at least as a major consideration for figuring out protein balance. And then I would certainly have a person take more acetyl L-carnitine with their proteins because proteins are made of amino acids. Acetyl L-carnitine is merely one of them. This is just something to break up the intensity of the conversation about exercise. Exercise, we know, improves cancer outcomes. That's as long as the person can, in a safe way, perform the exercise. If someone's absolutely depleted, they're not going to get benefits from exercise. It might actually counterbalance their efforts. But generally speaking, I try to get my patients to a point where we can do certain amounts of activity which um, enhance detoxification, improve immunity, improve mood. All of these things and more are, are needed for cancer survivability and thriveability. So let's go to the next slide, please. So this is important. The title of this article was The Alleviation of Multi-Drug Resistance by Flavonoids. Okay, these are plant compounds in breast, lung, colorectal cancer, and prostate cancer. So basically what we know is that flavonoids, the quercetin is one example of a flavonoid. Um, green tea is in the similar family as well. And what we know, if I read this last bullet here, is a major cause of cancer treatment failure and metastasis, which is spreading, is a development of multi-drug resistance. People just don't respond. This is a common thing in oncology. It's not a rare thing. And these plant chemicals reduce multi-drug resistance. I believe they should be used on absolutely everyone, or at least considered and, and ruled out if, there, if there's some reason a person shouldn't have them, that there are certain examples of that. But most people are going to tolerate these things fine. Let's move to the next slide, please. And I should mention, too, that there are literally tens of thousands of plant elements that fall into this class. So um, what I've done is I've put four basic products together, which I call superfood number one, superfood two, three, and four, which are green, yellow, purple, and red, which have concentrations of plants that have those colors and those pigments, which fall into these different categories of these plant phytonutrients, which have all these potential health benefits. Um, I should say that my products have not been specifically studied in cancer trials, but many of their ingredients have. And that's where I got the information to put certain doses and combinations of things together. Because you want to put things together in a synergistic way. So one plus one in a really good synergistic relationship could be worth six. So that's important to get it all right. So this is another slide on polyphenols and um, how they work. So a diet rich in polyphenols, again, don't be thrown by the term, uh, vegetables and, and fruits, okay? So a diet rich in polyphenols as prophylactic attempts to slow down the progression of localized prostate cancer has been shown. And they even talk about the mechanisms. These polyphenols are antioxidants. They help to block androgen receptors. They help get in the way of what are called um, signaling pathways in prostate cancer, which would signal cancer progression and metastasis, for example. So polyphenols have been shown to show benefit there. So uh, once again, uh, I don't see any other reason not to take them. Uh, the next slide, please. So this title of uh, this article was Potential Inhibitory Effects of Lycopene on Prostate Cancer. So most people with uh, prostate cancer that I've talked to are aware of lycopene. Lycopene gives tomatoes the red pigment, pigmented color. So the first bullet says the anti-cancer effect, the non-toxicity, the safety, uh, of, of lycopene has been investigated in several studies and it virtually causes no symptoms whatsoever, even at the highest doses or dose ranges. Don't think you're gonna eat tomatoes, you're gonna get the level of anti-cancer effects that these studies are in. That's why when people say to me, can I just eat the foods? The answer is no. You should eat the foods, but you need to take concentrates in the form of nutritional supplements. Otherwise, you just can't get the doses there. Most people don't know um, and how could they, if they don't, if they're not trained in nutrition, that there is a therapeutic dose effect. So it's not just a matter of, let's say, taking your vitamin C, but it's taking the right dose. We're not just taking lycopene or taking transresveratrol or taking green tea. It needs to be a certain dose to matter. But if, let's say, with green tea, you need a really high dose, 
let's say a dose that might make you sick, try and even take it. I have found if I lower the dose even 10 times, but I combine it with 10 other synergists, the doses are still low. You have better coverage and less volume, but you get effects as if they're high. I know that's a complicated statement there, but hopefully I'll clarify it as we move along. But um, what we know about here is um, lycopene, the last bullet here, has been found to effectively suppress the progression of cancer, the proliferation, the copying of the cells. It affects what's called cell cycling. And so there's a cycle uh, of, of progression uh, called the cell cycle that if it's working abnormally causes proliferation of cells. So arresting that or stopping that or slowing that down is a good thing. Lycopene has been shown to do that. Many, many of the phytonutrients have been shown to do that. So I always give them together. Next slide, please. And as far as um, grilling animal products, um, grilling is um, extremely toxic. Even the American Medical Association, American Cancer Society, and other affiliated types of groups are all aware of this. So grilled animal products, whether it's um, white meat or red meat, causes the formation of what are known as heterocyclic amines or HCAs or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These are highly toxic. I remember when I was a kid, um, I lived near the water and they'd have a lot of uh, barbecues and they'd have those little barbecue cubes there, you know, those charcoal, and they'd throw the lighter fluid on it and they'd have the food grilling. That is the worst thing that you could possibly do. And exposure to that at a young age could cause cancer decades later. So that's why we wanna use each day with the right nutrition to cause detoxification, to boost our immune systems, to reduce abnormal inflammation, to um, support all the systems that this, this talk will speak about. Now, I also should mention that, although I'm gonna cover a lot of nutrition here, and then I'll have a summary slide of, of a bunch of the top picks, you might say, there are many, many, many others that I might consider for a, a given patient's unique needs, okay? Let's go to the next slide, please. So, growth modulatory role of zinc in prostate cancer. So what does that even mean? So the function, so vitamin C function, I'm sorry, zinc functions as an antioxidant and plays a role in genomic stability. That means your genes right now can be changing and are changing due to normal aging, although almost no one is aging normally, um, pollution, nutritional deficiencies, nutritional insufficiencies, which means you might have enough zinc according to a lab test, but maybe you need twice as much. Why would someone with cancer need the same zinc as me? Um, but doctors don't think about it because they're not trained in it. Zinc is needed for at least 175 different enzymes in the body that I'm aware of. Magnesium, about 500. Vitamin C, around 3,000. Enzymes run the rate of reactions for healing. So zinc deficiency leads to severe diseases that can affect the brain, the pancreas, the liver, the kidneys, the reproductive organs. You name it, it can be affected. Zinc loss occurs during tumor development in many different cancers particularly the solid cancers like zinc, I mean, like uh, prostate cancer. So the prostate, you should know, contains very high amounts of zinc. So that's why deficiencies, as I mentioned earlier, of zinc can cause not only prostate cancer, but enlargement, but many, many other con conditions ranging from eczema to immune deficiencies, to increased risk of infection, to Alzheimer's dementia. So the uh, second bullet here says that zinc loss occurs during tumor development and then the, the last bullet says the, the knowledge that excess uh, zinc loss, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. The knowledge that excess zinc or excess zinc, so more zinc, prevents the growth of prostate cancer suggests that zinc mediated therapies are an effective approach for not just prevention, but also treatment. And, and that includes thereafter as well. Because if you have cancer in your lifetime, uh, the chances are that your body uh, is going to, you know, it, it, it needs something. So if, if your immune system is abnormal and it caused your, your, your prostate cancer, but um, thank goodness, uh, let's say medicine uh, and, and, and oncology um, cured you, it's not, they do not focus on improving your immune system. So zinc can help do that as well as, well as many other nutrients. Next slide, please. 
So this was some evidence uh, regarding the anti-tumor effects, the anti-metastatic effects, the anti-angiogenic effects of ellagic acid. So ellagic acid is another one of these phytonutrients in plants. So EA or ellagic acid is naturally, as a naturally occurring polyphenol. Well, what that means, just so you know, is that think of a stop sign. The shape of a stop sign is kind of similar to a phenolic group. That means a, um, that's a chemical ex expression used in chemistry. They say, okay, that's a phenolic compound that's shaped this way. And if you have a compound that's got a bunch of stop signs, a bunch of phenolic groups, they call it a polyphenolic compound. It has many, many, many of those groups. So that's just the particular structure of this ellagic acid, which gives it all of these beneficial effects in tumor prevention and treatment and recurrence. The anti-tumor activity of agallic acid has been mostly attributed to its ability to cause anti-proliferation. That means it slows down the abnormal copying of cancer cells. And it, it helps uh, apoptosis, so it promotes um, cancer cell death. And it inhibits cancer cell migration to other areas of the body, which means it's anti-metastatic. And it goes on and on for other reasons as well. So you might say, well, this is great, but how come I've never heard of this? Once again, if your doctors aren't interested in nutrition, if they're not trained in nutrition, that's why you haven't heard of it. Next slide, please. Radiation. I mentioned this earlier that resveratrol enhances radiation sensitivity in specifically in prostate cancer, but in many other cancers too, including every cancer that I've mentioned so far. So resveratrol enhances radiation sensitivity in prostate cancer by inhibiting cell proliferation. So if you inhibit this proliferation and it's slowing it down, slowing it down, resveratrol and radiation can act on it much, much better. And radiation, I'm sorry, and uh, resveratrol for various reasons, probably mostly because it is an antioxidant and also it, uh, it modulates what's called AMPK and these mTOR pathways. So again, we don't have time to go into what those mean, but I, I put them here because these are the ways in which these nutrients have been shown to work. So if you have a doctor that says, well, these, there's no studies done, not only have the studies been done, we know how these things work. Next slide, please. And of course, we'll uncover other ways that they work as time goes on. So here's another slide about green tea that I promised you earlier. So green tea and the risk of prostate cancer, a systemic review and meta-analysis. So a meta-analysis is a study where they take the properly performed, non-biased, well-organized studies, and they only consider them. Now, when I say that, what should occur to you is, well, I kind of thought that all the medical studies were done well. No, I would even say that most are not. And that's why they invented meta-analysis. Um, now, having said that, it's not perfect, but it does mean something. So phytochemicals, um, phytochemical rich foods are suggested to lower the risk of many cancers. And there are at least 800 different major cancers. And then as many, are, as, as many individuals as there are, there are not, that many different variations of cancer. So no two, two men with prostate cancer are alike. Green tea is considered as a, uh, an effective prevention for a lot of cancers. And higher green tea consumption was linearly related to prostate cancer risk. So the more green tea you drink or the more uh, ECGC, which is the, thought to be the most active chemical in the green tea, uh, the greater the anti-cancer effect. If you're gonna drink it, seven cups per day and higher will give you very strong anti-cancer effects. And uh, you can do that, or you can pop pills, which have that and a lot of other elements that green tea has, which are also other phytonutrients. So this is a very, very important uh, um, compound for people to be considering. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, curcumin. This is one of my favorite uh, spices. And uh, this was uh, information learned from a number of different trials. Extensive research over the last 50 years. So not one year, not five years, not 10 years, not 20, 30, 40, but 50 plus years. We have a lot of study on this, okay, has shown that curcumin which is a component of turmeric, can modulate multiple signaling pathways that are 
that are bad for cancer. So dose escalating studies have indicated the safety of curcumin at doses as high as 12 grams per day. So 12,000 milligrams, one gram equals 1,000 milligrams, 12 grams were given over three months. I've had people on these doses for years, by the way, have shown to downregulate all of these abnormal pathways in a variety of cancers. And, in, 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 and even prostate cancer has multiple signaling pathways which signal all these abnormal events that we call cancer. And curcumin modifies a whole bunch of them. Um, and even though it does that, I still believe that it needs to be taken along with other phytonutrients. But the last bullet here just lists a lot of those big words that I promised you I, I would give you just in case your doctor says, well, well tell me what some of those, those, those uh, pathways are that you're talking about. Um, well, you can then refer them to this, this uh, handout. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, omega-3 fatty acids and cancer. So again, I, I don't know if even curcumin has as much study as omega-3 fatty acids, but uh, certainly omega-3 fats have been studied extensively in the medical and nutrition literature. So over the past decades, extensive studies have addressed the therapeutic effects of omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids against all kinds of different uh, human diseases, not just cancers, but also cardiovascular disease and neurodegenerative diseases and neurologic diseases. So whether it's Down syndrome, autism, special needs of any type, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, neuropathies, anything neurologic, omega-3s are very important. If a person is taking any blood thinners, they can only take omega-3s and other um, natural blood thinners, like omega-3s or, or blood thinners, under supervision of a qualified healthcare professional because if you're taking blood thinners, medication like warfarin or platics or something, and you take uh, quercetin at, at a dose of 12 grams or, or omega-3s, your blood's gonna thin too much. So you might say, well, if it works so well, why, why are we using the medications for that? It's a good question. Um, we know that omega-3s improve the effects of chemotherapy and radiation, they improve tolerance, they reduce side effects. And the last bullet here says, clinical data on the therapeutic role of omega-3 fatty acids against breast cancer, colorectal cancer, leukemia, gastric cancer, pancreatic cancer, esophageal cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, all of these things, and something called cancer cachexia, um, which is a wasting syndrome that you need to offset if you're, if you're cachexic or sarcopenic, these are fancy terms for loss of metabolic energy and loss of lean mass. As lean mass goes down, immunity goes down, inflammation goes up, all the bad things start happening. That's why I do body composition tests on my patients to measure their lean, their lean mass to make sure I'm getting it right. Let's go to the next slide, please. Vitamin D, one of my favorites, because almost every doctor now uh, in every area of medicine knows about vitamin D. Uh, 15 years ago, even 10 years ago, that wasn't true. The studies on this are just so impressive that medicine just can't ignore it anymore. The problem is that I find is the, the most of the physicians that are treating some of my patients that we have in common they, they are not giving the right advice once they actually find a vitamin D deficiency. I just had a patient uh, just before this presentation who had multiple conditions that relate to vitamin D. Her vitamin D level was a 31. And the, the particular lab that they used, the range was actually 20 to 100, and she wasn't even told that she had a deficiency. But even if it was a 30 to 100, which is the most common range by most national labs, if you're a 31, Someone might actually say to you, you're good. Technically, you're normal, yes, but that's not okay. Particularly, we know that meta-analysis of vitamin D says that 70 is the magic number. That number seems to be associated with better outcomes, less chronic disease of all types, a much longer delay of chronic disease, lower inflammation. So what I'm telling you is that 30, 31, 35, 40, 50 is not as good as a 70. If you are concerned, or your doctor's concerned about giving you too much, well, that's why they're doctors. They should be monitoring your liver enzymes and your calcium. If your calcium goes up or your liver enzymes go up, you're taking too much. You stop taking it, 
those tests go back to normal, then you start again on a lower dose. But I've only seen that twice in 33 years. So um, I'm not saying you can't become toxic taking vitamin D, you certainly can. Vitamin D is a fat soluble nutrient, just like vitamin A, E, K is, and those are associated if you take too much because they're fat soluble, meaning they get stuck in your fatty stores and you can become toxic very fast as opposed to a water soluble nutrient where your body tends to urinate out the amount above and beyond what it needs, okay? I've done seminars uh, that are on my website. Uh, in fact, a, a 13 hour series of one hour talks known as the master's course, which you can look up, which uh, talk about how to like uh, know like the basics of vitamins from A to Z. And I talk about all these different things. So this evidence suggests all kinds of different studies that vitamin D deficiency is a risk factor for the development and the progression of uh, prostate cancer. Studies using cell culture systems and animal models suggest that vitamin D acts to reduce the growth of prostate cancer through regulation, cell proliferation, and differentiation. So if your doctor's wondering why and how it works, they don't want to believe it, they just need to read the studies. You know, I had a doctor say to me, well, I wasn't aware this was in my, my, my medical journal because I don't really understand nutrition. So when I would come across those articles, I would just flip the page. And that's what he told me. <laughs> okay. So to end it with vitamin D, if you have a low level, unless there's some other reason for you not to take the correct dose, the amount you want to take is a 50,000 unit dose once a week, not once a day, 50,000 units once a week for two months, then you check the blood again. That's another failure. I see the doctor doesn't say, come back and let me check you. Because how do you know you fixed it? If you're hyper utilizing vitamin D, your vitamin D might have gone from a 29 to a 32. Technically normal, but it's not a 70, not enough. Okay, next slide, please. Oxidative stress. So you've heard of the antioxidants. Antioxidants are antioxidation. So oxidative stress is generally speaking considered bad. There's a lot more to that though. Um, hmm. let, me, let me mention it really quickly, but I, I don't wanna confuse people too much, but um, some oncologists are confused about this. They say, well, why would I wanna give you, my, my patient, uh, antioxidants when some of the chemotherapy that I'm gonna use kills cancer through oxidation? Now, the answer to that is, for example, with vitamin C, when vitamin C is given intravenously, it's an oxidant, it's not an antioxidant. On the other hand, and this is a little chemistry, but I'm gonna say it here just for, the, for other doctors and for you guys, because you obviously are listening to this, is that when I say a nutrient is an antioxidant, that's really not true. That word is a misnomer. A nutrient like green tea or vitamin C or whatever, may act as an oxidant in your body or an antioxidant at different times, depending on the need of your body. So unfortunately, I have to leave it there, but other doctors are like, well, why would I give an antioxidant? If green tea is acting as an oxidant, you're not. But they read in a book that it's an antioxidant because most books are wrong because they don't clarify what I just clarified. Okay, next slide, please. And that prior slide, by the way, simply meant that oxidation is bad. And every nutrient I've mentioned so far um, can act as an antioxidant. So if, if one individual has over oxidative stress, if you give them a so-called antioxidant, it's probably going to act as an antioxidant. But it could act a different way as well. So it's good to run tests of oxidative stress to make sure you know what you're doing. So this slide uh, is talking about the use of something called DIM, D-I-M. Uh, diendolmethane. So um, this particular product, which you'll find in uh, cruciferous vegetables, um, has many decades of study in the oncology journals. There is no reason in my mind why this shouldn't be used for most cancers. So a uh, bullet number one says there's a large body of evidence that suggests that DIM, which is a compound derived from the digestion of indole 3 carbonyl from cruciferous vegetables. And basically, DIM, the way it works as an anti-cancer agent, specifically in human prostate cancer, is it targets the AMPK pathway. So you just need to know that, and there's some other ways it works you can see on the last bullet. 
Um, but the second to last bullet shows that DIM also induces cancer cell death. It inhibits the growth of cancer cells. It inhibits um, the production of blood vessels, uh, which can feed cancer cells. And it reduces invasion of cancer cells to other areas of the body or metastasis. They know how it works. Next slide, please. Berries, berries, and more berries. Um, pretty much can't eat enough of them. Um, all of the phytonutrients that I've mentioned are in berries. Um, and berries, particularly strawberries, they, they are particularly high in the uh, agallic acid. Um, but uh, I always have my, uh, my cancer patients eating all kinds of fruits and vegetables. And then I have them use uh, powdered superfoods, like the ones I mentioned earlier that I, that I made called um, superfoods one, two, three, and four, because in a single scoop, you could have the equivalent of 70 or more different vegetables just dehydrated. Now I have to tell you that I'm not saying that my product should substitute for fruits and vegetables. I, I wouldn't say that that would be ridiculous. Uh, I'm not calling my products, they're not foods. They're superfoods, um, that, that's a different way of talking about them, but they're not food substitutes. These are just legal things I must say to you. But you can see here, lung, bladder, prostate, breast cancer. I mean, the studies have been done. This stuff is very, very powerful. Next slide, please. This pretty much talks about what the prior slide did. So we'll skip by this. Next slide, please. Okay. And this is just reiterating that cruciferous vegetables have many different compounds in them like the DIM, the indole 3 carbonyl, something called glucosinolates, uh, uh, and a cambine, um, isothiocyanates. Uh, these are extremely anti-cancer. Um, now, the thing with um, a person with prostate cancer is, uh, and I really need to drill this home, is that, sure, you want to consider taking nutrients that have been studied for prostate cancer. But if you have other health problems, let's say you have hypothyroidism or low thyroid, um, if you eat a lot of uh, cruciferous vegetables, you will make your thyroid worse. So the way I approach a patient is, yes, I consider nutrition for the cancer diagnosis, but also nutrition for every other health problem that they need. And, you, and sometimes one health issue might negate the use of cruciferous vegetables, let's say if it's thyroid, as, as one example. So I would use other nutritional compounds in that individual other than these. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, this is something called a beta cystosterol. So beta cystosterol, as the first bullet said, is the most abundant plant sterol. A plant sterol is a, is a compound that resembles cholesterol, but in every, every way positive. Um, so beta cystosterol is one of the best ways of, use, uh, of, of lowering cholesterol. Um, and not only that, uh, I should mention that it's very high a concentration in salt palmetto and devil's claw. Um, I use supplements that have specific amounts of beta cystosterol because if you just take salt palmetto and, and devil's claw and you just hope you're getting enough beta cystosterol, you don't know how much is in it. But um, we know that it's effective not just for large prostate cancer, but also it has anti-cancer effects and anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, I could say a lot more about um, beta cystosterol, but we're going to try to stick to the topic here. So next slide, please. Okay, I mentioned this earlier on. Um, the Japanese mushrooms and mushrooms in general, most of them have been studied extensively and they have amazing uh, anti-cancer effects. Um, would I use these uh, as the only treatment in cancer? No. Um, but if someone has a history of prostate cancer in their family or breast cancer or any hormone-related cancer, I would want my patient to have more of these elements because they're so strongly prevented. But the D fraction, the PDF fraction of mushrooms, uh, not only boost immunity, but this is an example of how um, interferon, like IFN alpha, which is used by oncologists um, when it's appropriate for immune boosting, when you combine it with the D fraction of mushrooms, you get a synergistic potentiation of anti-cancer effects. That's the second bullet to the last one. Due to a synergistic potentiation of these two agents, the IFN alpha and the D fraction mushrooms, you get a much stronger um, effect on cell cycling. 
So cell cycle can promote cancer, arresting that, slowing it down. Uh, that's what these two agents do. One plus one in this case equals six. So sometimes you want to mix nutrition with the standard of care. Next uh, slide, please. And this one talks about soy. This is a confusing area for a lot of people I know in, in cancer in general, but particularly the um, uh, hormonal related cancers. So I'm gonna give you this statement here and then I'm gonna give you a different statement on the next slide. So soy appears to contain some compounds that resemble weak forms of hormones. So as a result, soy foods can mimic the action of hormones under certain conditions. Under other conditions, they can block the effects. Um, let's go to the next slide. I'll try to clarify what I'm talking about. Okay, so soy consumption and the risk of prostate cancer. This is an updated systemic review and meta-analysis. That's a good thing. So basically, meta-analysis provides a comprehensive updated analysis that builds on previously published studies. Now, they demonstrated that soy foods and their isoflavones, so soy has these chemicals called isoflavones. Two of these isoflavones are called genistine and daidzine, and they're associated with a lower risk of prostate cancer. 30 articles were used to come to that conclusion. So most of the studies that I'm aware of seem to show positive effects um, in those with cancer. Some studies don't say that. So I'm very selective when I use uh, these products with cancer patients. Um, sometimes I just, based on a, a whole collection of, of data and information on a person, I might completely avoid them or I might use them. So um, again, there's more to say, of course, this is a very short talk, but I'll leave it at that and, and we'll go to the next slide, please. So, these are some of the, the ways in which uh, one can figure out what their overall care should be uh, for, uh, let's say, prostate cancer or prostate uh, cancer treatment and or reducing one's risk of developing recurrence uh, later on or some secondary cancer or other problems. Obviously, you need competent doctors and, and nutritional practitioners, hopefully with medical background uh, as well. Um, basic and advanced laboratory tests. Uh, your oncologist, uh, believe it or not, uh, usually does pretty minimum testing. Uh, the basic stuff that they need that might include like a CBC and possibly a chemistry, and they're going to look at uh, cancer markers. And those, of course, are needed. But I sure would like to see a vitamin D3 in there. I might want a zinc level in there. I think you get the point. So um, we want to use some advanced uh, um, tests as well, vitamin C levels. And then a careful dietary log investigation. So I look at everyone's uh, diet over a, a period of time and then sequentially to, to make sure that they're eating appropriately and eating appropriately based on the metabolic rates as well, all their other health concerns, their likes and dislikes, and relative to their nutritional supplements. So obviously, I'm going to give proper dietary recommendations. We're going to talk about stress reduction. You want to lower your immune system. You want to promote inflammation. Be stressed out. So we always want to have conversations. I always have them with my patients. Uh, and I speak a lot more calmly than this <laughs> on how to uh, manage uh, stress in effective ways because it goes a long way for uh, immunity and inflammation and other, other types of processes which drive cancers. Exercise is always important too, but specific types of exercise for specific people based on their actual needs. Most people I find really have no idea what exercise really is. Sometimes a patient will say to me, well, I exercise. I do a lot of things throughout the day. I'm, I'm always on my feet. That's not exercise. Exercise has to involve elevating your heart rate at a certain uh, you know, rate for a certain period of time. Uh, there's, there's muscle building exercises for lean mass and there's aerobic exercises for cardiovascular health. You know, they, they need to be tailored to the person. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, nutritional laboratory tests um, and bioimpedance testing. So bioimpedance is the same thing as a body composition. Bioimpedance means I put some stickers on a person's hand, put them on their feet, the current goes through their bodies, they don't feel a thing. It goes through muscle, water, and fat at different rates because they're different densities, the current, and then the computer extrapolates what percentage of this person is lean mass, water, and fat. And it also measures many other markers of cancer, like phase angle. But anyway, 
if someone that I'm working with is losing their lean mass, I'm not helping them. They're not doing well. If they're doing well, let me put it to you this way. If someone's cancer markers are going down and their tumors, are, they don't see them and everything's regressing and their lean mass is worsening, in my experience and literature has shown that a recurrence is going to happen. If all those wonderful things I just mentioned take place and their lean mass improves, there's a much better outcome there. Okay. The same thing for something called phase angle. If you don't know what phase angle is, you might want to listen to my radio show on my, uh, under my blog section, or you can search anything on the homepage under the search bar called phase angle. And you'll see the higher the phase angle, the better the outcome. And that was from oncologists. And then uh, there is the pH of the body. We talked about that when we opened up the seminar. I'm not talking about saliva and urine. It's a lot of practitioners that base their whole nutritional plan on alkalinity and making you alkaline. And we talked about that as a myth and them using saliva and urine tests for that, which the acidity or alkalinity of those two tissues can change by me going boo or having you jump up and down. So they're not, they're not reliable, at least not for doing what's important with acid, acid base balance in an individual. If someone has with cancer, if someone has a urinary tract infection, obviously acid base balance of the urine is important. Second to last bullet, we want to identify and correct nutritional issues uh, regarding overall health and well-being. I cannot emphasize this enough. This is what I was talking about earlier. It's one thing to listen to a talk like this and have a whole list of nutrients, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But um, if, if you don't tell your doctor, let's say, about other health problems, which of course you would, um, and you don't nutritionally manage them, there's going to be uh, missing nutrition. So what happens a lot of times in cancer therapy is a person goes to the oncologist and every other health problem is dropped to the wayside. Uh, the, the oncologist actually told one of my patients who had a 300 cholesterol, he said, that's not my area. Now I can respect that, um, but he didn't even give him proper advice on how to follow through. My point is if someone has a 300 cholesterol, First of all, cholesterol can increase from cancer. So that person may need different therapies other than cholesterol therapies, you see. But I might give them um, natural uh, substances, some of which I mentioned earlier, that could lower cholesterol because they actually work on the cancer process. So my point is, if you've got a thyroid issue or you've got or, um, you know, uh, joint issues or pain or sleep problems or constipation or anxiety, you know, there's nutritional things there. So if you ignore those and you just do the cancer stuff, you're gonna create an imbalance. So you always wanna consider the whole person at one time. I know that sounds like common sense, but it's not how, how medicine is structured into specialists and categories and people not really talking. Uh, there's a lot of loss and continuity of care, it's called. So the last bullet is recommendation of the appropriate nutritional supplement that fit the individual's needs based on their diagnosis, the unique situation, the medications, the chemotherapy, the radiation, and all sorts of other important considerations. Next slide, please. And what I did here is I just summarized for you the nutrients that I have on my line of nutrients um, that you might want to consider, or at the very least, if you go to blooddetective.com and look up these nutrients, I have detailed information beyond what we talked about here for each one of these, which includes a lot of the medical references. So just real quick review of this, the DIM I discussed, the immunobalance has the defraction of the mushrooms, melatonin. I did not mention N-acetylcysteine, but studies have shown that NAC, N-acetylcysteine, um, has very potent um, anti-cancer effects, but, and also in prostate cancer. And 3,000 milligrams also can have a favorable outcome uh, upon COVID-19. So I'm not saying that NAC, NAC is a substitute for whatever medical treatments there are. It's not, but the studies, are, there's been a lot of fantastic studies done and I've, I've done several uh, talks on this during which I name the specific studies which show that 3000 milligrams of NAC can help reduce the effect of, of COVID on a person uh, that improves the severity of the condition if they have it, keeping it at a lower keel and better recovery. So all three of those aspects have been studied with NAC. NAC, one last thing about that, it's a mucolytic agent. It breaks up mucus. If that is important for COVID-19, I don't know what else is. That's why these respirators don't work. Because if the respirator is trying to get through a thick 
piece of mucus or mucus in the lungs, uh, it can't get through. So you have to break up that mucus. Melatonin, I'm sorry, NAC is so good of the mucolytic agent when it breaks up mucus that it's used in cystic fibrosis, which is a genetic condition of abnormal mucus formation in the lungs, which cuts the lifespan of these individuals down for decades. And this stuff has helped. The omega-3 fatty acids, the superfoods, the green, orange, purple, and red, they have all those phytonutrients that I mentioned, plus many others, the phenols, the polyphenols, all those things. And then trans resveratrol, the transform is what you want, the type and structure of resveratrol that's been used mostly in the studies, vitamin D and zinc. And then I believe the next slide is probably the last one, so we can move to that. Yep, and there I am. And that uh, was a bad hair day, sorry about that folks. But um, you can email me with any questions that you have at info at blooddetective.com. You can go to my website, which I've mentioned here, or my other website is uh, drmichaelwald.com. It's actually the same website, but there it is. And only call me if you're interested in actually seeing me. Otherwise, please send me your communications through the email. And we're going to now uh, transition to questions and answers. Thank you. So um, I, I, I must say, um, uh, uh, I learned a lot uh, in, um, in a very few minutes. Um, I, I myself stopped drinking coffee, um, uh, then um, uh, completely shift to green tea. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I know with my own um, uh, prostate journey, um, that, was, that was one of the things that had been recommended uh and um and i assure you that um that uh uh the whole uh holistic uh, approach the whole person uh, uh medical care is such an essential piece uh nutrition uh cannot be said enough how important it is um because it it really tackles um, so, uh, so, um, hey, thank you. Um, uh, uh, Wilfredo, um, I, I believe you had, um, a question to ask, uh, Dr. Ma Dr. Michael. Oh, hello, Dr. Michael. Um, Hi there. First of all, I want to thank you for your presentation. Very comprehensive and very thorough. Thank and you. I look forward to future talks with you because there was a lot of information, which is great. Um, just reading a few uh, questions here from the chat. Um, one question is, uh, does sugar feed cancer? Okay. Um, I did a radio show called Sugar, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, which talked about this a lot. But the long and short of it is, there are different types of sugars. Fruit sugar, no. Um, fruit sugar, uh, fructose, for the most part, most fruits have fructose. And that's safe for even diabetics. So that's fine. But glucose and sucrose, which are the simple sugars, and in refined and processed foods, you'll find those in. Uh, those uh, are, they tend to be bad. Um, I also have an article on my website of like 50 ways in which sugar adversely affects the body. It promotes inflammation, uh, it, uh, which is enough, just that alone. And we can go further. So the long and short of it is, yes, we want to remove all glucose and sucrose if with, the, with the exception of grapes. Uh, grapes are glucose. Now, grapes would be good to have uh, when you're exercising heavy, and you need to give you, yourself simple sugar that is healthy. Um, uh, and so therefore, grapes would be good for that. But otherwise, all the other fruits, particularly the berries, are the best types of fruits. But there's a lot of misunderstanding regarding sugar. So sugar, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you should listen to that presentation. Please. I have another question here. I guess there's uh, some coffee drinker out there. <laughs> Um, concerns about drinking coffee. I know uh, Louis just mentioned about that. He switched to. I, I never drink coffee. <laughs> I'm joking now, but I but I drink coffee. You know why I drink coffee? Um, let me answer this question. See, I did that because I needed to show you that a person does not have to be neurotic in their approach to health. Now, if there's a reason, if someone has anxiety and sleep problems, they should not be drinking coffee. If they have palpitations, they should not be drinking coffee. Caffeine enhances phase two liver detoxification. So help the body detoxify chemotherapy and you want it out when it's, when it's done its job and detoxify hormones. 
estrogen and testosterone are both partially detoxified by what's called phase two liver detox, which requires, well, not requires, but caffeine enhances that. So caffeine in coffee, that's an herb and that has some uses. And there's also sometimes that you don't have it. Like I mentioned, palpitations, anxiety, things of that nature, sleep problems, insomnia. Okay. Um, another question, uh, is distilled water healthier for you than regular water? Okay. Um, probably not. Um, there are some instances where the type of water really makes a difference. Um, but I have not found uh, it to be a, a, a player. Um, I mean, as long as it's uh, fluoride free and it's mineralized, uh, I think that's fine. I have some patients that have done some research and they feel that reverse osmosis water is better for them and then they supplement minerals. I just can't, I haven't been able to really determine if that's a major factor other than wanting, you know, clean water of some form, okay? What's more important about the water is proper hydration because being underhydrated is, is very common in cancer as well as with many other diseases, which can affect a lot of metabolic processes very profoundly, even mild uh, dehydration could make, for example, tolerance to chemotherapy, radiation, and to nutrition uh, being less effective. Okay. Uh, another question about vitamin D, um, the differences between uh, vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. Yeah, so most prescriptions are vitamin D2, which I think is a mistake uh, because vitamin D2 uh, may not convert to D3 in everyone's bodies. But for some reason, it's assumed that everyone's gonna convert it. So um, I use, when I use 50,000 units of uh, vitamin D, because the D, vitamin D2 is usually the, it is the prescription form and it's given with the 50,000 unit. Um, you wanna measure the, 20, the um, 25 D3 on blood and the one comma 25 D3. So you can see that you take D2 and if the D2 is converting it to D3, you'll see the D3 increasing. And if you really want the anti-cancer effects, the 125 D3 has to increase as well. I start with D3 because I assume that a cancer person may not be adequately converting D2 to D3. I asked, the, well, I've asked this number of pharmacists, just this is how I get my kicks, that this is my life. I, I like to drive pharmacists crazy. So I'll say to them, why do you give, uh, why do the doctors give D2? And they're like, oh, is this D2? <laughs> and they're the ones that made it. So um, it, it really necessitates a person educating themselves. You, you want D3. If you're given D2, Okay, but you need to check those levels. And if the doctor's not saying to you, you need to recheck your levels in two months or some period of time, then you just don't know if it's working. I believe with, with vitamin D, isn't there something else you need to absorb the vitamin D? Yeah, you're probably thinking of uh, maybe eating it with a fatty food like an avocado or raw nuts or seeds. Eating um, fat soluble vitamins with fatty foods uh, is thought to improve their absorption. But I've never seen any issues with someone getting vitamin D3 absorbed when they take it. If they take the doses, it's going to go up, as long as they're monitored properly. I have another question here about regarding the age. Uh, what age do you recommend taking supplements? Um, it could be any age. Uh, I have uh, you know, infants and, and small kids that, that take supplements. For example, kids that don't eat any fruits and vegetables. Uh, kids with special needs and autism, for example, the very picky eaters sometimes. Uh, that's a generalization, obviously, but you know, and then they, they tend to like my superfood, or, or, or they'll, they'll be able to, to take a sublingual or a chewable vitamin. You know, uh, this can help really make the difference in the quality of their diets earlier on until they develop more mature attitudes towards foods if they can, if they have the cognitive ability to do that. So um, it could be at any time. So depending on the health problem, if there's a nutritional, potential nutritional connection, it doesn't matter the age, it just matters the appropriateness. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Um, one more question, uh, does higher testosterone increase uh, risks of prostate cancer? Yeah, you know, there's been some confusion uh, about that. Um, I would say yes. Um, there are definitely studies that testosterone can both increase prostate cancer uh, risk, uh, prostate cancer aggressiveness, 
and also prostate enlargement. Um, and then there are some studies that uh, show that uh, in the absence of prostate um, disease, uh, additional testosterone can uh, be very good for lots of uh, health issues, improving lean body mass, strength, uh, general sense of well-being, uh, possibly lowering even cholesterol. So again, the same thing with the medication applies to, to, to nutrients. The right medication, the right nutrients at the right time for the right person in the right dose, that's how it should work. Well, I have a question. Um, you mentioned a lot of com uh, compounds are derived from vitamins and herbs and vegetables and fruits. Um, you mentioned one, uh, res reserve resveratrol. Resveratrol, yes. Yeah. What What is that derived from? Yeah. So you'll get that from all of the all of the the fruits and vegetables have some amount of resveratrol. So um, the 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 ones that are more red with more red pigments tend to have and and uh, grapes. And, and grape colored pigments tend to have higher levels. But um, again, you're gonna want a, a wide variety of fruits and vegetables in the diet. And um, if there's actually cancer present in a person, uh, I will also always recommend separate resveratrol that I give in a controlled dose. So that's the stuff that people have heard about in red wine um, that's been said to lower uh, cardiovascular risk due to the, you know, the, the, the French effect or whatever they call that, which was actually not ever true. That was, um, that was a lie. Uh, but um, we do know that resveratrol is the real deal. Not only that, um, you know, on a, on a chromosome, let's say my iPhone's a chromosome, uh, there's a tail on it called the telomere. And the telomere shrinks as we, as we age. And um, resveratrol is one of the nutrients along with zinc and vitamin D and vitamin A, just to name just a few, that have been shown to slow down the shortening of the telomere, which um, is, a, is, a, is a generally considered a good thing to do. So these are, these are nutrients that affect genetic expression in positive ways. And earlier, before you started asking your questions, uh, our very kind moderator mentioned uh, green tea. It's one thing to do green tea, but you want the right dose. So seven cups minimum, uh, if you want to get some of those effects, or less with a pill. That makes sense. Okay. Um, <laughs> I have a question that kind of stood out for me uh, when you mentioned about grilling. Yeah. Um, I wish you bought like one of those, uh, those, uh, those are charcoal starter chimney things you know, to avoid using the, the, the starter fluid and you know, using less chemical in, with, with the charcoals. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about grilling that affects the food again? Can you mention that? Again? Yeah, the process of grilling, the heat process, along with the proteins and other elements in the fats, produce these very, very toxic chemicals. They're so toxic. Um, and this may be not the exact uh, paraphrase, I'm in paraphrasing right now, but the American Cancer Society, when they're talking about breast cancer, said that there is no amount of grilled food that is safe for someone who has had breast cancer. And they say the same about alcohol. So there's no, no safe amount. So it should be avoided completely. Yeah. And if you're going to eat those products, um, it's really no joke. You, you, you want to at least supplement yourself appropriately. Um, it's always best to eliminate the unknown trigger. But some of my patients, they won't for various reasons. Uh, they say, well, I'm not going to change my diet, but I'll take supplements. Or I'll just change my diet, I will not take supplements. Or I won't exercise, so do the best you can with foods. Or whatever it is. But um, uh, you know, if you're not going to eliminate certain habits, not you personally, but uh, people, then um, you want to try to mitigate them with nutrition uh, and other lifestyle methods as much as possible. Oh, well, let's see, we have a few more questions. Sure. Um, and, uh, do I have to combine, like, take ginger and black pepper along with cumin? Um, oh, okay. So there's ginger, there's black pepper fruit, which is um, a registered, under the registered name, biopterine. And biopterine is black pepper fruit 
that when you combine that with, um, with turmeric, if you take turmeric alone and you take it, about 85% of that is gonna be urinated out. But if you combine it with black pepper fruit, 85% is actually absorbed and utilized. So ginger has nothing to do with that. I'm not aware of any uh, effects on absorbability, but I can tell you that black pepper fruit and, um, and turmeric, along with other polyphenols like resveratrol and quercetin, you will enhance their absorbability exponentially. And that's what you want. Um, one person is asking about uh, the difference between uh, um, wild berries and whether they're better than regular blueberries. Yeah, yeah, they're much better. Um, there was an article in the New York Times uh, a handful of years ago where they compared wild berries and those grown on farms. Uh, and the nutritional content varied from dozens of times higher in the wild varieties to thousands of times higher in nutritional content of all of these helpful phytonutrients. So there's no comparison. Um, well, a question uh, about um, uh, the impact of GMOs mm -hmm. and GE versus organic fruits. Okay. So, um, I wrote a book on uh, genetically modified foods called Franken Foods. Um, and uh, so I do know something about that. And on my website too, there's at least one video when I was interviewed by, um, um, I think it was ABC World News Tonight possibly, or maybe it was Channel 5, Channel 5, about this. And um, as far as genetically modified foods, uh, you know, I personally think these are a problem. Um, there are, there are, there's now some evidence, some, some real solid evidence of cancer promotion with consumption of genetically modified foods. They can actually modify your genes um, uh, and affect you in other adverse ways. So as far as um, organic foods, there's no promise that when you eat organic foods, which implies that they are not GMO, a lot of these GMO farms are within spitting distance of the organic farms. And all you need is wind to blow these things over. And Monsanto, for example, had sued many farmers uh, because they were able to test Monsanto. They, they got samples of, of, of the foods on their uh, farms and they, they found that they were genetically modified uh, simply because of the wind blowing it over from somewhere else. And they were able to sue these farmers, putting many of them out of business. But my point is that you never really know if what you're getting is truly GMO uh, free. Uh, and in that case, all you can do is support your health as well as you can. And that's what we're left with as far as I can see. Um, I have one more question, uh, whether it's healthy to take melatonin every day. If a person needs it. So, um, and it can be used for many, many things. Um, anything neurological, uh, to be honest, in my, in my years of doing this, most people say it doesn't help their sleep, but it helps other things. It's got anti-cancer effects. It's got effects in special needs conditions. Uh, I once wrote an article about, um, should a child take melatonin? Is there any problems with them taking it on, on, on you know, ongoingly? And uh, studies are showing it's, it's very safe. So, um, I would say, yeah, if a person needs it, then they would take it just like they might take a prescription drug every day except natural therapies tend to be a lot less um, potentially problemsome, generally speaking. Um, one question regarding of whether, is there anything to fluoride ca causing calcification? Fluoride, you said? Causing calcification? Yes, fluoride, yes. Um, there are some studies that are suggesting that. Um, I'm more concerned about fluoride being a potential carcinogen. Um, and uh, you know, if you test your own water, from day to day, you're gonna find all different kinds of fluoride levels. Um, fluoride can interfere with thyroid function. So, um, but can it, it, it cause calcium accumulation? Um, yes, uh, it, there are some studies that, that show that. Um, too much vitamin D can do that as well. Hyperparathyroidism can do that. Um, the most common cause of high calcium on a blood test is actually laboratory error. So um, you wanna make sure to test things more than once to make sure uh, that you got the right finding, but yeah, fluoride can do that, potentially. Uh, excuse me. It's okay. Um, 
There is a question about taking the vitamin C as a tablet or chewable. Okay. I don't recommend chewables because vitamin C is ascorbic acid that tends to uh, wreck the enamel on the teeth. Um, and if you're going to be taking vitamin C, let's say for anti-cancer purposes, you're going to need way too much. You can't do it in chewables. You'll have no teeth. Um, and when you take vitamin C orally, um, the best form for most of my patients, at least, is buffered ascorbic acid. So it's not acid anymore. It's buffered. So um, the chewables tend to be ascorbic acid, so I don't recommend those. And the tablets, depending on the company, uh, like I use tablets, but I don't have them so tightly compressed. They don't have to last 20 years on the shelf, so they tightly compress them, and a lot of them just pass in the stool. So I tend to use my capsules, which are not as tightly compressed, or tablets, or capsules, but mostly I use powder. Um. <clears throat> A uh, question regarding the the, the tea of uh, uh, the comparing up against supplements. Mm -hmm. uh, seven cups of tea can't do, but are supplements just as good? Uh, I think supplements are better. Yeah. Um, you get um, guaranteed amounts of things if you use a reliable company, and uh, you know what you're getting. You just you just don't know what you're getting with with the tea. Sometimes they can be just over dilute. Um, it's just, um, it's too important to mess up. And why don't I leave with a one final uh, bit of information um, for now uh, regarding zinc, uh, because there are zinc lozenges, okay? Those are not gonna give you the therapeutic effects. Zinc lozenges or zinc gluconate, that's good for topical throat problems. You're not gonna get any of an effect systemically. The type of zinc, uh, depending on the person, might be zinc, um, picolinate might be the best one, or a zinc bisglycinate chelate is, a, is probably one of the better ones in the cancer area that I'm aware of. So not all zinc is the same. Not all forms of vitamin C are the same. Clearly not all forms of vitamin D are the same. Not all forms of vitamin E are the same. You know, so it's important that a little knowledge can go a long way. All right. Okay, well, thank you, thank you Dr. Wolf. And thank you everyone for having me. Thank you, Dr. Wall. Uh, um, uh, well, you all know uh, where to find him, the blood detective. Um, uh, Dr. Wall, an amazing presentation. Obviously, as you can see, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of questions. Um, uh, um, uh, your service uh, to the community is, uh, is uh, without question, uh, uh, um, very, very needed and very, very on demand. Um, so thank you for coming for cultivating heating and healing and uh, justice initiative support services Inc. Um, and uh, for stand up uh, against uh, prostate cancer and uh, and thank you for uh, 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 helping uh, in the medical world uh, with the diagnosis of helping improve uh, individuals' lives through holistic approach. Um, and uh, we hope to see you soon uh, again on our uh, men support platform. And the last thing I might say is again, thank you very much, everyone. And I see there's a lot of other questions. If you go to the blog section of my website, the blog section, post the question so everyone can see them and I'll respond. If you have any trouble with that, just email me the question, but I prefer if you put it on the blog. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care and good health to you.